Well, thank you so much, Abby, for joining us today on the Leadership Podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure. Now, just to set context for everybody, um, we are still in COVID. Um, we are still in January 2022. And uh, Abby is my guest today and she is on maternity leave. And so I've been very cheeky and speaking <laughs> to her. Um, she's not quite back to work as her role of director of Spring Harvest, but she is willing to speak to us today. And so tell us a bit about family life right now, um, where you're at, uh, where you're based, um, and just give us a bit of a gist of the, the life of Abby Guinness right now. <laughs> the life of. Um, I live in Brighton at the moment, which uh, is actually sunny as we speak, which is nice. I have three small boys, so uh, they are five and a half, uh, three and a half and eight months old. And that is noisy, challenging, um, joyful most of the time. Um, but yeah, I, ha <laughs> I, I have to say having three is harder than I thought it would be. I was a little bit naive, maybe, but um, kudos to all those people who've been there before. Um, and you've had even more than that. Uh, yes. I love being a mum. I'm enjoying it, but I also quite like going back to work. <laughs> yeah, yeah i can imagine especially having three boys and and having had only two boys and two girls so we're four but that's you know sometimes it's different makeup of family it can be pretty full-on especially i think in this last season i mean just last sunday at church we got able to applaud all those with children under the age of five because we just think anyone who is managing small children in this last couple of years is is you know impressive so well, well yeah I, isolation is not helpful for parenting i don't think I think, yeah, the more community you can have, the easier it is to be a parent and the bigger your wider your family, the easier it is to raise children. So the pandemic has not been kind, I don't think, to parents. Um, I have to say I have followed the law as much as possible, but probably not the letter of the law. You know, sometimes when we're in isolation, we have we have uh, ranged out of our property, but just made sure we don't see anyone. <laughs> I'm sure you're not alone uh, finding anything we can to kind of manage the last season we've been in. Um, so, you know, you're, you said to me uh, before we came on, you said that we were, you're, you're winding up on your maternity leave. You're about to come back to work at Spring Harvest in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. How is it feeling as you sort of coming towards the end of a season and starting another season? Yeah, it's, um, it's a funny feeling going back to work, really. I suppose I would call it bittersweet in terms of uh, I enjoy maternity leave. I enjoy being allowed to focus on the children 100% of the time, um, get to know the new person in your family uh, and that side of things and, and to use a different part of my brain and a different part of my focus and energy. Um, but then in some ways going back to work can be a bit of a relief just for a change because it's just relentless, isn't it? Being with small children, especially at the age that mine are, they're at that phase where it is literally mummy, 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 all day long. And you're just like, I just want to go somewhere where someone doesn't use my name 10 times every 30 seconds. Um, so I, I like getting back into the office as well. There is a slight nervousness of, oh, can I still do this? Um, but I think it's a bit like riding a bike. It kind of comes back to you once you just take a deep breath and jump in. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because this will be the third time you come back from maternity leave into yeah. the workplace. And I know for many um, women who've, who've done exactly what you've done, that, that can be quite an un certain time you said about the nervousness of going back and how, yeah. how that might feel obviously you've got some experience now of having come back twice before <laughs> because things do change a lot in a year uh you know or 10 months yeah. or whatever it might be um can you tell us a bit or maybe give us some advice those listening of how do you either make it a really healthy space for someone coming back or how do you welcome people back properly or how can you prepare yourself to come back well I think I've been really uh, I don't know whether to say lucky blessed I don't know my my colleagues are wonderful and they've been so welcoming and made it so easy um I'm trying to think what it is that they've done in order to be able to give advice I think just being just being pleased to see you <laughs> is nice just knowing that someone's happy that you're back um uh someone said to me last time I, I visited oh it's like you've come home um and it is just nice feeling needed and welcomed and wanted um and and being keen just to fill someone in and saying look hey stop me if I'm boring you but this is what's happened um, and don't assume that I know anything is what I always say to them. I say, I've kind of been watching what you've been up to, but I haven't really paid attention. So just assume that I know nothing. Tell me everything. Um, and is that I mean, that's partly my job to say, don't worry about offending me. Just, you know, I'd rather you told me too much than not enough. Yeah. So um, 
I think for me, the difficulty is, is going back, just feeling like a, in some ways, a bit of a different person. You're so much more tired <laughs> for a start. And you think, am I going to be able to juggle as many things as I used to? Um, there was once my first time back at work after my first maternity leave, I had to park the car around the corner and have a little nap before I went into the office because I was worried I wouldn't quite make it through the day. Um, I'd kind of felt very sleepy on the journey in and thought this isn't a good start. Um, so the odd power nap at lunchtime or whatever is, is quite helpful. I love that a bit of advice. Have a little nap in the car before you head in. That, <laughs> that's a great comment. Um, I have to set an alarm, otherwise I'd have been asleep in the car all day, probably. <laughs> that's that's wonderful. And and the idea of just saying to people, just assume I know nothing. That that those two, two good bits of advice there. Um, rather than people just assume you're going to slot back in exactly as you were a year ago. You've changed, everything's changed. And yeah. to, to never assume that's that's powerful. Um, now you're coming back just in time for this year's spring harvest, which I, I, I don't I, know. I, hate, you... I would hate to miss one. <laughs> I was about to say, was that deliberate? No, not deliberate, but was that like <laughs> a, a, a excitement or was that like I'm coming into the busiest time because spring harvest starts? It's an Easter event for those who don't know. And, you know, this is where it's getting really busy. It is. It's land. Full on. <laughs> yeah, it's the full on time of year. I mean, partly it was planned in that all three of my kids have been born in the summer because uh, the summer months, because actually that is the quietest time for my job and it fitted in quite nicely. But it does mean I'm coming back right at the busiest moment. But in some ways, that's it's also planned because my colleagues do an amazing job of holding the fort and filling in and doing all the work that needs doing. But I, I like to be able to support them and help them by coming in before the end, before the event. To, to just check everything over and go, has anything been missed? Has anything been dropped? And just, cause I've been there a while now, I never expected to be, but I've actually been working for Spring Harvest for 11 years, I think in total. So I'm one of the ones who can look down the list of what's been done and go, oh, has anyone picked this up? And has anyone missed that? And has that been done? And has that been done? And, and in some ways it's quite a useful time to go back just to make sure nothing's been dropped. Um, which I have to say, it, it never has. It's very humbling to go back and realize that you're not that essential after all. <laughs> Now, Spring Harvest is a huge event which has been going for over 40 years in the UK. It's an incredible mm -hmm. achievement to have something that's been so consistent throughout all the ups and downs that we've seen in those years. But mm. a couple of years ago, I remember there was a special moment, obviously a very challenging time. We went into full lockdown as a nation in March 2020, and all yeah. the plans for Spring Harvest just got shelved. And yeah. I was part of the team then working with you. But I remember that moment because we ended up going online completely, or you went online for Spring Harvest. Yeah. And and everything was online and Spring Harvest went free. And we just said, let's give this away for free. Let's make it available to anyone who wants to watch. And you ended up being the face of Spring Harvest for pretty much. <laughs> you were like hosting every single session. And you were like, the, you know, you were like the, the, the kind of the, the MC of connecting all the different videos coming in from various people's houses and yeah it was really way to do it really because no one was allowed to see each other and it was the first it was very unexpected to go into a lockdown I have to say I mean again no idea that was about to happen some people said to me I think this is about to happen and I was like no they can't do that can they um so yeah I mean all the lorries were packed to go to Minehead uh which was starting first everything was kind of ready to go and then this announcement came and I was the person who <clears throat> having Having been pulling it together behind the scenes, I was the person who kind of knew the most in terms of who was doing what and what was coming from where. So it made sense just to kind of be the almost like the, the string holder trying to pull it all together. Um, and then we the short notice was like, do you know what? We can't we can't sell tickets. We don't even know how to. We're going on YouTube because it's the best no way we know how. It's got to be free. We'll ask people for donations to help us out because this is, I mean, financially, I thought at that time, I thought this is it. This is, you know, Spring Harvest is going to close. If we can't run the event, we're, we're done for. Um, so I genuinely thought it was the last thing we'd ever do. <laughs> I thought we're going into this as a last hurrah. We've got all this stuff we've prepared. Um, let's do it. And I also felt like Spring Harvest is a family, you know, I know the guests and, and a lot of them know me and I felt like I was talking to my family and it was OK and it was safe. I had no idea that hundreds of thousands more people would tune in because it was free and online and everyone was in yeah. lockdown. Yeah. So um, in a sense, that was kind of terrifying. Um, had I thought about that, I might have been more reluctant to go ahead. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the numbers were incredible. It was like this almost incredible moment where the world seemed to be on lockdown and no one had anything mm -hmm. to do. And suddenly Spring Harvest pops up and goes, well, we're free and we're online and flick onto our, your YouTube and you'll be able to see us. And the numbers yeah. were something like, was it almost 2 million views or something worldwide? It was some huge number yeah, of views. I can't remember the actual individual views, but I know there were 187,000 
Wi-Fi hubs. So different Wi-Fi hubs got connected or IP addresses, I think they call it. So yeah, and it was from 1992, I think different countries around the world. Um, on that first night, the very first celebration we were live streaming, it tells you how many people are currently watching on YouTube. And I'm looking at my laptop in the corner of the room before going live and it's like 8,000 people watching. And you know that those are households watching together, together. So it's at least double that in terms of the number of people. And I was like, oh, well, that's bigger than I was expecting. <laughs> now I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> and then from then on, it just went up and up and up. And that first night got viewed, I think, 70,000 times by the end of that week. Um, yeah, just very unexpected, um, but a real privilege to be able to do it. Yeah, because Spring Harvest has been a big part of your life, hasn't it? I mean, I know you work for yeah. them and you have a senior role with them, but it's been a big part of your life many years before you were employed by Spring Harvest. Tell us a bit about your, your journey yeah. and some of those key moments. Well, I, I had never been as a kid, actually. I know lots of people had. Um, Spring Harvest is about the same age as me, <laughs> but I had never, never went um, in those early years. But I went for the first time as a 21-year-old. I think. And I was part of Riding Lights Theatre Company, which was my first job out of university. And we were the performing company on site in Skegness for three weeks. So my first experience of Spring Harvest was full on three weeks on the trot in Skegness. Um, and I thought, what? why have I never been here before? This is amazing. Um, and really enjoyed myself. Um, following that, I was working with Rob Lacey, who wrote the Street Bible, and we mm. uh, founded Lacey Theatre Company. And so I went the following, not the following year, but the year after, I think, with Rob to Minehead. Um, Rob was very involved in Spring Harvest in those days. And so I, I got much more involved through him and, and knowing him, working with him. Um, and so I'd been at Spring Harvest as a performer, really, as an actor. Um, and a couple of years after that, someone said to me, oh, we're short of a host. It was Russell Rook, who was the chair of the planning group at the time, he said, we're short of a host this evening and you're going to do it. And I said, really? He said, yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're doing it. I said, but I, I don't do that, Russ. <laughs> he was like, you do now. Um, and so I hosted uh, on the big top, as it was then, stage in Minehead um, and found that I felt strangely at home. Um, and so Spring Harvest has given me loads of opportunities. I, I had spoken before. I'd been a, a public speaker before, but not to the extent that I was when I started getting involved in Spring Harvest. So I was given opportunities and I was encouraged and supported and enabled um, to try bigger, bigger stages and bigger things and take on more and more responsibility. So, yes, I'd, I had done it in other places, but it grew to a new level through my involvement with Spring Harvest. And um, I'll always be grateful for that. And that I wasn't just thrown in. I was supported and, and helped and mentored through it. Yeah, and it's been. Did you meet your husband at Spring Harvest? Oh, he used to be on team. At Spring Harvest. No, he was. Um, that was another one. It was Detling Festival. Yes, um, that's right. And my mum met him first. <laughs> <laughs> she vetted and approved. She did. Yeah, she and then she set us up on a blind date. Amazing. But now um, I remember he joined he, the team at Spring Harvest one year. He has. Yeah, he since he since joined the team when we were engaged. He came as a stage manager, and um, yeah, he's been involved since as well. So. Amazing. Brought, brought him round into the team. <laughs> you, you mentioned your mum there. Now, I mean, I want to talk a bit about family, uh, not just your family, you talk about your boys, but also the family you're from. And I think you've got incredible yeah. heritage. I'm going to ask you whether that was, a, is that a hindrance or a blessing when you come from a family? <laughs> you, you know, for those that know, your mum has written multiple books. Your dad um, is, is, is was a vicar and, you know, was also a well-known communicator. And, um, you know, was that was that something that kind of put you under a bit of pressure to go a certain way? Or was that something actually you just thought, what, what a joy to be part of that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I suppose seeing them, seeing them leading and growing up in that environment just made it natural, made it feel natural to be in leadership, I suppose. So in that sense, um, a real a real blessing and it, it, to be able to to say even now, 40 years on, I, I admire their leadership and respect the way that they function and work and they've been incredible role models um so in that sense of course wonderful sometimes I think I feel a little bit nervous in terms of you know how people talk about nepotism and you know it, it's all about who you know and have they opened more doors for me that I couldn't have opened on my own and I does that matter I don't know I think we should all be opening doors for each other whether we're related to each other or not um and, and it probably has opened some doors. I can't think of any specific ones. Um, I'd like to think that I have done things on my own merit, but um, 
but actually we are a product of, of where we come from and family is important and and I will of course I'll open any door I can for my children but I also hope that I would do it for those who aren't my children too you know I hope that I'll be a good role model to uh, all sorts of people and to open doors for anyone I can um yeah so it's something I often think about I think about oh do I do what I do because of them or because of me or because of like but I don't think you can actually unpick it I don't think it's that straightforward yeah um yes. But very certainly very blessed to have great role models, I would say that, and to have learned a lot by watching them and, yeah. and along, working alongside them. Now, I'm also fascinated because your dad is from the famous Guinness family. Yeah. You're from the famous Guinness family. <laughs> so, so my big question for you really is, do you get a lifetime supply of Guinness? Oh, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? No, the, um, the last member of the Guinness family who was still on the board of, of Guinness, the company, well, it's owned by a company called Diageo now, I believe, um, he retired about five years ago um, so there are no longer any Guinness family members involved in the company and there's not there's not a link but but my great great grandfather is it two greats no that's my dad's it's three greats for me three great grandfather was the brewer Arthur the first brewer so it is the original family but there's no money in it anymore I'm afraid and in right. fact my my great grandfather renounced his inheritance because it came from alcohol and preached teetotalism on the doorstep of his brother's brewery so <laughs> My, my parents stories. always say our side of the family is a different kind of spirit yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. yeah the lots of missionaries actually in my side of the Guinness family which is very inspiring yeah and I think the, I mean the Guinness family is an incredible story and I remember visiting the factory years ago and I always remember seeing what was your great 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 grandfather's signature on a 5,000 year lease wow. which, which I just love the 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 vision that someone had to go I'll sign for something that's for 5,000 years yeah. That's like incredible amazing, forethought. And also the other thing I noticed when I went to visit it, um, I can't remember when it was now, a while ago, they've set up his office as they think it was. And it had an open Bible on the desk and there was always an open Bible on his desk. And he, um, I love the fact that, the, you know, the Guinness company had housing for its employees and paternity leave and sick leave and sick pay before it was even a thing, you know, look after the staff and, yeah. and that there was definitely that kind of spiritual element behind it. You know, God... I'm serving God and therefore I will serve my staff. Yeah. And I love the fact you you've, you actually have continued that tradition of, you know, looking out for others. I know at the moment you've been telling me your work in local politics in the local school. <laughs> you've got yeah. your little sidetracked your return to leave to try and sort of protest around plans your government have around the school that the local government have in Brighton around the school there. Yeah, um, I mean, we've all got to use the skills we're given, haven't we? And someone said to me, I was, I did a little bit of a speech for the council and a couple of people said to me afterwards, wow, you should do public speaking for a living. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, th these are the skills I've got. God's given me a gob. Um, so I'll try and use it for my community, uh, with my community, alongside my community to get hurt, to get the voices heard. So there's a lot of parents in the school who want to be heard, but don't feel confident. And so, um, so yeah, the skills that Spring Harvest and, and ministry have given me are now being useful in my local community, which I'm pleased about. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, um, Spring Harvest is this, incredible, like you say, it's a great place of training and development. And I've had mm -hmm. the privilege, like you, of being able to stand on various stages and, and be stretched in, in my leadership and ability to communicate. Um, but I think it's amazing for families. I know for you, you used to run the Big Start, which is like the early morning all age program at the event. Yeah which is this incredible we often would get thousands of people turning up I mean it, I used to think it was really early but my kids I was gonna it. say nine o'clock's not that early when you've got small children <laughs> but it would all we'd all sort of cram in the space and before social distancing and, yeah. and tell us a bit about that because that was an incredible creative experience uh, that, that you were heavily involved with many years yeah well I think even before I had children I've always been really passionate about all age worship um I was one of those students uh, when I was a student and I, I went to church. I was like, I don't want to be in the student small group. I want to be with normal people and real people. I want to be with. And so I used to go and help out in the kids church and go back to my hall of residence covered in glitter by Sunday lunch when my, <laughs> my friends were just getting out of bed. Um, I just think there's something powerful in the family of God learning and worshipping and living and loving and laughing together, um, whatever your age or ability and so when I went into initially into theatre and performing and writing, for me, it was natural to um, enjoy performing with kids. So when I was in Riding Lights, we did Christmas shows for kids that were really fun. And then at Spring Harvest, the big start, or as it was then, I think Good Morning Big Top it was in the early days. Um, it was that experience of actually these theatrical skills, this storytelling 
is brilliant with the Bible, you know, it's, it, it teaches everyone, not just the kids, you know, the adults are getting a lot from this too. And so using creative skills in, in those morning sessions, it just felt like it unlocked a whole new way of, of being church together, you know, performing the Bible story, having something really interactive, doing actions in the songs, um, even prayers, you know, the way we do prayers, can we move when we pray can we take a pose with our bodies that helps us show god what we're thinking or saying or and just thinking really about all the senses being engaged means that our faith comes alive for the very very youngest as well as the oldest and it means that we come away from that session knowing the one thing we wanted to remember about god today was clear do you know what i mean like sometimes you can hear a 30 minute sermon you can go oh there was so much in that oh, I, I'd like to take away that, 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 and that. And then by the end of the day, you've forgotten them all. Whereas you'd come out of the big start going, the one thing I want to remember today is that God hears me. Yeah. And, and then you do, and you remember it all day. And you think, yeah. and so I'm still passionate about that now. I will still fight for all age worship and get really emotional about it. And I know it's hard to do. And so many churches find it so difficult, but I will still fight passionately for it because I think it's important. And I think mm. you don't have to love kids. To, to know that it's good you don't even have to have your own it's about being creative and and engaging with our senses and letting the bible live i think yeah that's great i mean i've got some lovely memories of being there i remember a couple of years ago i was there with my dad who was in his 80s uh, my my brother and his family my my wife and i and our family and there was probably i don't know 15 dendies um, <laughs> all on the sort of the, the the seats at the back there my dad dancing and we videoed it and whatsapped it to all the rest of my family who weren't able to be there and it still lives on this sort of, you know, the dad dancing, even in his 80s, loving just being in the presence of God with all this wider family. Yeah. And, you know, you can't beat that. Um, you can't. And it's also, I think people forget when they go, oh, I don't want to go to an all age service because it's not for me. They forget that actually it's not, it's not about me. I don't go to church for what I can get. I go to be part of the family and for what I can give. And actually kids don't go there thinking, I want to get something out of this for me today. They go just to be part, to be present, to be part of the family. And we can all get something. We can all give something rather than get something, I think is, is what I'd be, what I think is important to say. So Abby, talk to us then about, you know, you've been, you're now a director of Spring Harvest. You've been there for 11 years. Uh, you ex you experienced it before with your, you know, roles in the theatre companies. Um, can you tell us a bit, maybe some practical tips or your experiences as shaping and uh, as a leader through those experiences? You know, it's a big national event. Uh, the opportunities you had maybe some of the key moments where you thought yeah that really helped me become who I am today mm. oh that's a really big question Sim <laughs> I figured we warmed up to this point so now I could throw in the big one but for those listening who are like oh, I want to lead really well I want to be better at communicating I want to be better at putting events together and you put on one of the biggest events for a number of years now um, yeah what, what experiences you could you share I think one of the main things I would say is don't run away from something because it's hard. And I have felt God say that to me actually in the past. I mean, this is about whether it's work or not work. Initially, the first time I ever heard it was about, um, I've mentioned Rob Lacey earlier and, and he passed away at the age of 43. Um, and just after that happened, his wife, Sandra said to me, would you come and I was moving to Cardiff. Would you come and live with us? Would you move in with me and the kids? And I, my first instinct was, no, I can't do that. That's too hard. That's going to be way too hard. Um, and I really felt God say, don't run away from something that's hard because those are the opportunities to grow. Um, for a start, like I just said, it's not all about you. <laughs> um, but also you, you will grow as a result. And, and so I did, I, I moved to Cardiff and moved in with, um, Sandra Lacey as she was then and um and I did grow in that experience and it was and I went to drama school at the same time and that was one of the hardest things I've ever done and I grew through that and learned so much and and similarly at Spring Harvest you know somebody once said um why don't you try breaking a world record and I was like no that's too hard <laughs> but we did it and it was actually really hard but we did it and Spring Harvest still holds um a Guinness world record for the most people whistling we whistled crowned him with many crowns for over five minutes uh with over a thousand people <laughs> are you serious i'm serious the certificate is in the office that's an amazing achievement a thousand people whistling crown with many crowns okay yeah and we had to Not whistle for more than five minutes all of our mouths at the end our faces were like oh this is really difficult um Wonderful. and also trying not to smile because it was just so fun as well um but yeah so 
just don't run away from the things that are hard. And, and I think similarly, that's what happened in the pandemic. I got this kind of sense of, oh, three weeks to go, the event's not happening. Um, and I made a few phone calls, the first thing I did. Um, obviously around, we've got an amazing planning group, and lots of people who are involved in Spring Harvest. And I said, what do we do? We, do, we, do we just go, right, that's it. Spring Harvest isn't happening. I said, I've got an inkling we could do something online. And I think it could be, I think we could do a lot of what we do online. I know we haven't got much time, but what do you think? Um, and enough people went, yeah, we can do this. <laughs> it's gonna be hard, but let's not run away from it. Um, the first thing I did, this is another piece of great advice is get involved with spreadsheets. I made the biggest spreadsheet and we called it one spreadsheet to rule them all. And it had absolutely every piece of video content that we needed um, and who was providing it. And then and it ended up getting more and more columns. So then obviously when you put something on YouTube, you have to give it tags so that if people search for it, they find it. But then there was a column with all the tags in it. And then there was a column with this and that. And, and there were over 250 videos. And in the space of three, and there were loads of us working on it. So we shoved it in Google Docs so everyone could access it. And um, it was bonkers. Um, but don't run away from something because it's hard. Just make a big spreadsheet. <laughs> Those are my two pieces of advice. You know, of all the information and advice I thought I was going to get from you today, I never <laughs> thought the outcome would be get good at spreadsheets. Uh, that's an amazing piece of advice, but very yeah. practical, very helpful for those listening. Uh, well, get yeah. good at spreadsheets. We used to often say, we put it in the grid. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a creative person, but I'm also an organized person. And those two things don't always go together. Um, but everything that I have found hard has always had a spreadsheet behind it. <laughs> I guess it's something about getting the, the the complexity of something and putting it into a, a form that makes some kind of sense. Yes, of, exactly. You know, and and that, that is exactly the thing to say. And people often say that to me, even when I'm, if I'm preaching and I'm, I'm speaking, people say, oh, that was really straightforward and, and kind of, it made sense. And I think that's one of the things I care most about is making something complicated easier. Yeah, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Well, we're going to start wrapping up, but this year, Spring Harvest, it's all going ahead. It's going to be it in is. person for the first time now in... <laughs> three years since 2019 this will be the first time back yeah. together Skegness Minehead and Harrogate no just take it I think Harrogate's been postponed again okay but I should probably check my details on that one but definitely <laughs> Skegness and Minehead definitely <laughs> Skegness and Minehead between us both we're out of touch a little bit but it is happening this year and it's online as well and so people yep. can book in online but especially want to highlight the importance of families uh, getting to spring harvest I know yeah, I mentioned totally. to a couple of people in our church recently, they just said, oh, I, they've got small children. They're going, I'd like to go back to spring harvest. They said, I haven't been back since my 20s. Yeah. They're now in their 30s, got two small children going, we'd like to go back to spring harvest again. Well, That's often kids, the story. Well, for kids, the best thing about spring harvest, obviously, is the spiritual content and the input and what they learn about God and how it develops and grows their faith and their maturity. 100% the best thing. Also, great second uh, fiddle is that Butlins is really fun. <laughs> and the kids absolutely love it and my kids come back with those two things in equal measure having loved butlins um but also really having grown in confidence in their faith so important yeah. yeah it's so true i've had the pleasure of being part of the spring harvest children's teams in the past and they've been both in my time as a, as a leader developing an opportunity but watching children worshiping god together in a room yeah. with newfound friends from across the uk is an incredible experience and so we would encourage you to do that um so yeah online in person and and Abby will be there back from maternity leave fully. So thank <laughs> you so much. Well, thank you for being part of this conversation today. Thank you for inspiring us with your spreadsheets and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and your God-given gob, I think is what you actually said. I'm quoting you here, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I appreciate that. So um, we often say here on the Leadership Podcast that we really, really believe that leads get better. Everyone wins. Everyone gets better when the leader gets better. And what's the last final piece of advice for you that helps you get better as a person that has an impact and uh, influence on those around you? Um, well, the first thing that's come to mind when you ask that question, because again, that's a big question, isn't it? A deep one, but it's, it's to be humble enough. Just know that you don't know everything. Uh, the older you get, the more, you know, you don't know. I think there's probably a better way to say that the less you realize, you know, something like that. Um, yeah, I just think it's become very, very clear to me in recent years. You, we've just have to know how little we know. If we go into something thinking I know it all and my way's right. And I've got all the answers. It's just a surefire way, first of all, to make enemies, um, but also to fail. Um, the, we're so much better in a team um, and certainly Spring Harvest benefits from an incredible team of people who are all willing to give their time, their expertise, their energy, 
um, some of them paid, some of them voluntary, uh, a huge amount of volunteers, thousands of volunteers make Spring Harvest happen. Um, and so learning from each other and listening and being prepared to go, I think I've got a good idea, but someone else's might be better. And in fact, I know I've got a good idea, but I know it'll be 10 times better with the input of others. So, yeah, it's just knowing knowing that you don't know everything and uh, and letting other people do some stuff. Um, and also, when you're, you just mentioned my gob, which I mentioned first, I know. But when you're one of the people who does a lot of talking, it can be very easy to just keep talking and just keep bluffing and just keep doing it and just keep... And you've got to remind yourself, I have to remind myself, stop and listen. Someone else probably has a better idea. That, that is brilliant wisdom. Abby, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time here on the Leadership Podcast. And um, we're looking you. forward to next time. We're going to be inviting uh, your friend, Chris Rogers, chair of the event, to come and join us, tell us more about the event. But thank you so much for breaking into your maternity leave and joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. <laughs>